Um, there are plenty of other things we could talk about. Something I'm wanting to pick Vinay's brains about um, during our kind of panel discussion now are about these ideas of appropriate technology and intermediate technology. Because, Vinay, you are something of a celebrity in, in such spheres uh, for inventing the Hexiert and a very portable and easily constructible shelter. Can you tell us a wee bit about the Hexiert and how that could be used off an apocalypse, but is already being used in, in disaster relief and situations like that? Well, so the, the question with all this stuff is basically how do you keep people alive? Right? And um, you, you kind of have two resource streams, right? You could pull things out of nature, like your fuel, or you could pull things out of the industrial supplies chain, like the metal that you're making the stove out of. And the hex shirt was an attempt to figure out how to take stuff out of the industrial supply chain in sufficient quantity to rehouse something like uh, 150 million, 250 million climate refugees. Because this is way more than you can do with tents. There just aren't enough tents. So the hex shirt takes plywood, which there is an astonishing amount of, and just puts six sheets of plywood on their sides in a hexagon. Then you take six more sheets, you cut them in half, you put them into big triangles, and then you put those on the roof. <coughs> and you hold the whole thing together with wooden blocks and screws. And th this is something that you can knock out in a couple of hours the first time. After that, you can do well, a group of about five or six people could do about one an hour. Um, but around that, you need to put things like the gasification stoves and somebody doing water purification and toilets and all the rest of that stuff so that you have a system that will keep people alive, a kind of life support system. Getting this kind of stuff into mass production is difficult. Uh, IKEA took a crack at designing a shelter <laughs> eight years ago took a very, very complex high-tech path. That and no one understood the instructions in the first place. <laughs> no, no kidding. <laughs> the thing takes four hours to put up, even on the trained team. Um, but it also doesn't have, the, because it's got so much custom engineering on it, it's very hard to do at scale. Uh, so the simplicity of things like the gasification stove is the key to getting enough of them produced to make a real difference if something does go catastrophically wrong, or indeed just to deal with poverty, which is kind of like permanent catastrophe. <laughs> I think you have a great quote about something like the... The, your lives after the apocalypse will be a lot like the lives of the people today who are growing your coffee. Mm. And, and the idea is that there is such a disparity in, in kind of wealth mm. and, and living conditions, mm. even in the world today. Sure, um, sure. That needs to be addressed. I mean, the kind of mortality rates that you see among, the, say, the poorest 500 million people on Earth are mortality, mortality rates that if you saw them here, you would associate with something like a pandemic. Uh, being poor is just permanent disaster. Yeah, there was something I wanted to ask you as well. Oh, so we're into the kind of relaxed chat mode now, so do feel me to pitch in anything else as well. And then about 10 minutes time, we'll come open to open the floor to all of you guys as well, so get thinking of hopefully not too scary questions uh, for our panel here. Uh, but Hugh, you showed a map at the beginning of your talk of uh, impact sites around the world from different meteorites. And there did seem to be kind of a big red stripe across the middle, so it's some parts of the world are more likely to get smacked than, than other parts. Is this just to do with the, the plane of the solar system and where the impacts are coming from? Well, actually, uh, I, I, didn't, I can elaborate now, I guess, on, on how we generated that map. Let's see if we can find map. that slide um, as you, as you yeah. so, so, so that map was generated by, essentially what we do is we, um, we look at the asteroid's trajectory. Um, and, and obviously, we, we understand the Earth's trajectory around the sun. Uh, but we don't know the asteroid trajectory perfectly, so there's some, some error associated with that. So you can imagine that um, it could be, uh, the asteroid could be at one point or it could be a bit further along it on its orbit. Um, and what that means is, is, is when you kind of run that forwards through time, you end up with a line on the Earth um, where the asteroid could hit. Um, and the, 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 the red, how red the, the, those lines are indicate that a higher probability um, and the cooler colours are uh, a lower probability. So some of those lines are really long. They, they can wrap around the Earth uh, all the way. Some of them look really thick. Um, and that's because uh, it's not just a line that we're not sure about. Actually, um, there are other aspects to, the, to our knowledge that, that isn't good. Um, so, so essentially, what, what that represents, actually, um, I'm, I'm missing the legend on the, on the side. It's, it, it gives you the probability of impact in those areas. The issue is, is I, I mentioned how many near-Earth asteroids there are, so over 16,000 of them. Um, we're looking at, um, potentially here, just 67. Um, and, and of those 67, um, some of them can hit multiple times. 
so, so you're seeing there uh, about 260 I've lines. I've just got a bouncing asteroid image in yeah. my mind. So, so if, we, if, we were able, if we had the knowledge and, and, uh, and the time to put all 16,000 on there, all, all the ones that, that potentially could hit the Earth, it would just cover the Earth. Uh, so, so actually, uh, as I said before, the, the real message is that everybody is vulnerable to that. that so these aren't the 67 biggest, this is just a random subset yep. of all of them just to get the idea of yes, the different yeah, tracks. Yes, exactly right. There's, there's no one place you could move to to minimise your chance of having the this, this sky upon you. Uh, no. Or if so, you did know, you probably wouldn't tell us, would you, before everyone rushes uh, No, I already have my beach house set up. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, and Ros, there's something that I was wanting to explore a bit further mm with you as well. He gave us a lovely introduction to epidemiology and the mathematics of spread of, of these diseases. What sort of things can we do? What sort of things are we doing right now to prevent those outbreaks? You explained about the different transmission numbers and how some of them you need to hit very, very quickly before mm. it blows out of control. Others, you've got a bit more time to, you know, Use, display your resources and, and start, yeah. start responding. Well, one thing that um, I should mention, though, is that these, this total percent of people infected by the end of the epidemic, that assumes that um, not only that you do nothing in response to the epidemic, but that people don't change their behavior in response to the epidemic. And people always do. You know, there's, there's this thing that we call reactive social distancing, which is when people decrease the number of contacts that they have in response to there being an epidemic around them. And so what that does is that pushes down the uh, transmission rate because it decreases that number of contacts. They also, people may also um, take uh, precautionary hygienic measures, which can decrease that percent, uh, the, the probability of infection on contact. And both of those things will push down the, uh, the transmission mm. rate and help to bring the epidemic under control. So all of our control measures aim to take that reproductive number and bring it down below one. Because when that number comes below one, on average, each person will infect less than one other person. And it fizzles out. And it naturally. will eventually fizzle out, yes. Yeah. So for, depending on your disease, it, it, it just depends on what you might want to do. So for instance, during the 2009 swine flu pandemic, um, there were considerations to close schools to try and decrease the contact rate between children. So you can do things like that for flu. During the um, Ebola... Just, just, just quickly, yeah. how long would you need to have that gap for? Is that closing school for a couple of weeks? Yes. I mean, that's a bit longer than a, a nice snow day, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a day or two off school is fine. A couple of weeks off is, is a bit yeah. too much. Well, it definitely, and also you've got to think about the um, economic costs. So it, it's bad for kids to miss school, we take mm. that as a given, but also somebody's got to look after the children. Um, and so what you can do with mathematical models is try and figure out the optimal, if you decide to close schools, try and figure out the optimal time to do it for, and also you can weigh that against the costs mm. of hospitalizations, if you like, and the cost to the economy. So yeah, you can try and work out those quantities um, using mathematical models. And that will depend greatly on, on the transmission rate? Things. Yeah, it'll it's depend on what you're dealing with. Yeah, exactly. Which, which pathogen. And the, the um, interventions that you might want to use vary according to pathogen. So for example, during the Ebola outbreak, um, it was important to do safe and dignified burials to prevent transmission after people had died. That's not relevant for flu in the UK. So you've got to tailor your interventions for um, what the epidemiological yeah. context is. And in an event about the apocalypse, much like this event right now, mm -hmm. uh, which, which pathogen would you be most concerned about? Is, is, it, is it some disease that's kind of on the, on the radar of, of tropical disease monitors that perhaps we haven't even seen about in the newspapers yet? Oh, no, I don't have any classified secrets. But <laughs> I think that um, always people are concerned about what's going on with the highly pathogenic bird flus. Um, so that's one to bear in mind. Also, there's ongoing transmission of MERS coronavirus. But, no, I mean, I'm not concerned about any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see she has her fingers crossed. Um, do any of you have anything else you want to add before we throw to the audience? Um, uh, if it's all right, I just wanted to ask you something, Lewis. Uh, uh, you, so you talk about the, the gasifier stove. Um, first time I've ever heard about this. So if an apocalypse happened tomorrow, I'm now set, um, <laughs> which is great because I know about that. But what you about can be in my apocalyptic survival team if you have at least okay. three useful skills. Um, but what about the people who didn't know about that? Um, how do they survive? Um, 
so the, the point behind the knowledge, this book I wrote about how you could, as a thought experiment, go about rebooting civilization, was the idea that you would have that one book and one book only, which would condense down everything you need. So as a sales tactic, <laughs> it was pitched that perhaps, just for peace of mind, you should buy a copy of the book and maybe buy a couple of copies to give to your friends and maybe a couple of spare copies to bury in the garden in a, in a nice watertight <laughs> box. Um, but you're absolutely right. If you, if you don't happen to know something, then you can't exploit that knowledge. And, and that is the story throughout history. We, we've discovered things about the natural world and how it works, which we've called science more recently. And then you uh, apply that knowledge or exploit that knowledge and the technology and the inventions that, that we make up to make our, our lives easier. So something like a gasifier stove, I think, is a great exploitation of our understanding of um, the pyrolysis process as the wood breaks down and then making a very efficient custard warmer, like <laughs> my previous <laughs> little video here. Um, or as Vino was saying, in kind of disaster relief areas, it's, it's very, very important. Sweden and, and the Scandinavian countries have entire power plants using that process. They don't use empty baked bean cans, have great big <laughs> enormous furnaces, and they gasify uh, trees they cut down from their forests, which is all very sustainable. They generate electricity incredibly cleanly, and then because they're combined heat and power stations, they also use that hot water to heat the surrounding area as well. It's, it's like 85, 90% efficient. It's an incredible technology, um, which is a bit like my baked bean can, which is why I use it as an exemplar. It, it took a long time to get those right, though. I mean, you know, the, 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 there's this kind of huge internet subculture of people tweaking those designs. And it took them about 15 years yeah. to get one. Like, for the, cars or just for the, the oh, just, just the small ones, because gas fires like to be big. Right? When you make small gasifiers, they get incredibly fiddly. Yes. Uh, so without the internet, so people, so people could show each other the designs and refine them in all the hobbyist tinkering, uh, they wouldn't have worked. Like 15 years ago, nobody knew how to get bean cans with the right combination of holes and gaps and air and all the rest of that stuff. Did I just to totally that? nail it on the luck then? I mean, that was my first bodge <laughs> attempt and it seemed to work. Yes. I just thought it was easy. <laughs> but moving on, uh, are there any questions from the audience for any of our panel members about general aspects of the apocalypse and what we should be scared of or not scared of. Uh, asteroid strikes, pandemics and diseases. We do have some microphones. So if you've got a microphone at the top, there's a question here. I'll come to you second. We'll come right to the front for our first question. Thank you, John. Um, Rod, I was interested in terms of reproduction because obviously you're tending towards 100%, but obviously the limits mm. never actually gets there. But um, if you have reproductive, Ab reproduction or lack of reproduction after uh, a relevant pandemic or epidemic, mm. what would the implications be? I mean, do, would they be considered within a model as being, um, you know, not recovered and therefore they fall into the dead category? I mean, I was just interested as to how that fits in. What, so this is people who... Um, who... Who lose the ability to... To, to infect somebody. Yeah. Reproduce like I have a child. Yes. Oh, um, no, I, yeah, we don't really um, think of, think about the, uh, that being an outcome. Mm -hmm. So you could model that if that was, uh, if that was relevant. So there's some um, infections that um, are really important for, uh, say, people who are pregnant. So rubella, um, you want to avoid pregnant women getting it, same for Zika virus. So you can take that kind of thing into account in your models. This is a very simplified example. So if you wanted to study something specific about, about that, you would have to design a, okay. a specific one. Yeah, yeah thanks. Because I guess the other important aspect there is not just how many people have been affected so far, mm. but is how, what proportion of your society at this moment Mm. is not going into work, not going into the power stations, not going to the hospitals. Is that the sort of thing you look at? Are your models more on the epidemiological, mathematical side? And uh, Oh, no, you can do that. Um, yeah, you could... Um, you can uh, calculate how long people are sick for, and then uh, you can work out how long they don't go, for, go to work. Mm. So a lot of mathematical modelling, not necessarily what I do, is um, trying to understand the, uh, the impact on society and the costs, not just the direct healthcare costs, but absenteeism and things like that. Mm. And also, if your epidemic is um, uh, quite frightening, then you can get a uh, decrease in people wanting to go to wherever it is. 
So for example, during the SARS outbreak, there was a massive decrease in um, people going to Canada when they had an outbreak there. And no one from America traveling to Africa when, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when so, Ebola had broken out in mm, <laughs> a couple hundred miles. Yeah, yeah. so um, you, can, uh, you, can, you can calculate that if you want. Yeah. Vinny, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, the, one, of the, one of the things which I think would be really useful uh, is if we had really well played, uh, well, well laid plans for using survivors. So if you have something like a flu, you catch the flu, you're immune to that strain, and you may be back on your feet in a month or six weeks. So having immune survivors take over the management of critical infrastructure, kind of work shadowing, and then if the person you're work shadowing gets sick, you just step into the role. There are lots of things like that that we could be organizing at a global scale that would give us enormously more resilience than we have now. Same thing with the social distancing stuff. Like, if you've got well-played plans for everybody just commutes by internet for a couple of months, you can basically ride out a pandemic with a quarter of the fatalities or something that you would get otherwise. But we don't do the planning. We don't do the preparation. Everybody's like, well, you know, not this generation. And this is because people just aren't scared enough, you think? Well, I mean, the, if you look at the stuff that's happening right now with the cladding on buildings, right? Something like 120 samples went in. All of them have turned out to be flammable. Now what? Right? You know, that's kind of caused a panic. Now what? No panic. So we're, we're very bad psychologically, and I think this is partly media and partly human psychology. It's just hard to get people motivated to do stuff in time. We had a, a question up on the top. Is the microphone with you now? No, I, am I loud enough? I can hear you. So if society was to entirely collapse and we lost all of our buildings and technologies, are there enough raw materials still on Earth for us to rebuild to the state we're in now? Mm. Oh, is that that question at me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so a lot of the stuff left lying around in the abandoned buildings and deserted cities would, would still be there. You'd still have a lot of iron ore lying around, which would be very rusty girders, which you could then resmelt, like the metal hasn't gone anywhere. But one of the key resources that was critical to us bootstrapping through the Industrial Revolution um, may not be accessible so easily, and particularly uh, coal. A lot of the easily accessible coal seams near the surface we've already dug up. There's a large reserve left in you know, kind of China and Russia and North America, but where you're trying to survive, there might not be an easily accessible fossil fuel to, to, to drive the kind of processes that we've come to rely upon today. But even more acutely than coal, you probably will not have access to crude oil, which is what I was hinting at with the, the video of the gasifier stove and, and the car, because all of the easily suck up of all crude oil around the world we sucked up a long while ago and we're now going miles off into the North Sea and drilling, drilling very deep into, into the subsurface there. So in a sense, one of the ideas I explore in the book, in the knowledge, is could we go through Industrial Revolution 2.0, but it'd be a green Industrial Revolution? Could we inch our way through without relying on enormous reserves of coal and oil? Could we leapfrog perhaps straight to something like solar panels and provide the energy uh, we need that way? Um, but you're right, there's, there's a couple of, kind of interesting aspects to explore um, in that area. Um, questions from this side. Can we go to the chap with the red top in the middle? I think. We can throw the microphone at him. Um, I've got two questions. In the case of an apocalypse, how would you regain intercontinental travel? Um, you would struggle in, 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 the <laughs> <laughs> in the initial conditions. I mean, we had intercontinental travel in the late 1400s and early 1500s, right? We, we, we harnessed the power of wind and sails and, and ships. It just, you take the slow boat, literally, rather than trying to fly in 10 hours to, to get between the continents. Um, so a classic trope of post-apocalyptic sci-fi books are having families that happen to be split because someone had gone to, on a business trip or they're on holidays in different parts of the world and then the collapse of civilization happened and what would have been a, a really easy thing to do just to fly back home in a couple of hours is now essentially an infinite distance that you can't really travel by yourself. So don't do that when the apocalypse comes. <laughs> Make sure you're already where you want to be. Was there a second quick question? And um, what would be the hardest a life, modern technology skill on that list you showed us earlier to regain? So things like computers and electronics uh, require 
a huge pyramid of technology and infrastructure underneath them to, to make something like your iPhone. Like the iPhone is just the, the tip of this huge iceberg under the water you can't see of factories and weird elements that we've gone to a particular place in the world to mine and, and process and refine. So things like that would take a long, long while to get back up to if you're recovering from scratch. And you'd be back to simple forms of entertainment like reading books and, and telling stories around campfires um, as you dodge the cannibals, I think. Um, again, at any point, <laughs> guys, pitch in uh, with anything you want. Um, should we go... Where's the microphone at the moment? Should we come to you here, sir? And then we'll go to the lady right at the back after that. Yes. Hi. Um, we, we find that uh, Apocalypse has this, this grip it exerts over our imaginations, but we don't seem to be very good at taking practical measures to avert it. Um, I, we, you even find that some people will kind of romanticise when they're faced with the prospect, they romanticise that we might get thrown into some pre-industrial idyllic agrarian state or, you know, or maybe even the human race deserves to go extinct or something like that. So I, my, my question is, um, you know, what, what pra you know, how can we change, how can we use this fascination that people have with apocalypse in terms of, kind of ent as entertainment, as thought experiments? And, and focus that into practical measures to avert catastrophic risk. And, to, and, and can you give us an indication of maybe how far away we are from that appropriate response in some of your respective fields? Thanks. Vinay, is there anything you, you want to say? I mean, this is, this is yeah, kind I, of your area. I, I will say that I think the, the hardest part of this is that elected officials are really unwilling to scare the public. Right? And there are a lot of things that the public really ought to be quite worried about. Um, I, mean, I think <laughs> I mean, that was nice and succinct. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say I think the space stuff is actually coming along quite nicely, but compared to the resourcing it needs, I mean, you, you tell me. Uh, yes, well, as um, uh, and certainly in the USA, I mean that's happening. They've, they've cancelled the mission to go and um, study an asteroid and to and to test uh, particular planetary defence uh, technologies. Um, they cancelled that mission. Um, yeah. So so. So, so, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that, that, that um, um, officials do not want to worry people. So it's great that you're here so we can worry you and then you can spread, <laughs> spread the news. Um, spread the fear. I, I think from my perspective, I think, I think it's fair to say that actually technology is, is uh, offering us a, a way to prevent um, the catastrophes that I've mentioned, so, so the asteroid impact and, and the space weather as well. There, there are things that we can do that involve technology um, so as soon as the technology goes, then obviously we, we have a bit of a problem. Um, and I think what's interesting is that, is that there are many, many risks that we are aware of and, there, and that people are investigating and studying and trying to do something about. I think if you're interested, uh, I can recommend a book by uh, Lauren Child, Clar Clarice Bean. Has anybody read the Clarice Bean books? Yes, yeah, some people have. Yeah, so so they're, they're not aimed at adults. This is, this is a story about um, a little girl going to school. And there's one particular story where um, she's worried all the way through and she d finally discovers what's the worst thing to worry about. Does anybody know what the worst thing to worry about is? It, it's, it's the thing you never saw coming. Hmm. It, it, it's, it's, it's something that is unexpected. So I think as, you know, we have all this effort going into trying to solve the, you know, and prevent the apocalypse, but it's the thing we don't see coming that is going to actually cause us the problems, I think. And we see that time and time again. Accidents, we call them. Yeah, accidents that, that we weren't aware of. That in hindsight, you look back and you say, actually, we should have seen that. That all the evidence was there, but actually because of the complex nature of society and all our interactions, we just don't see it. I think those are the things that I worry about the most. So I'm, I guess, Clarice Bean in that respect. Yeah. Uh, we had the question lined up? Yeah, here we go. Half a question and half a comment, because what I did, the first thing I thought is, y your sp stove lo looks like a jolly good idea, but you've got to get an awful lot of tins and the right size to, in order to make it in the first place. And that came on to the thought that, in fact, there are two sort of ranges of, a couple of apocalypses. One which destroys lots and lots of people, and the other which destroys lots and lots of stuff. And if you just destroy lots and lots of people, I think we just will find the nearest supermarket which has lots and lots of 
lot, lots and lots of, you know, tin food, which we can sort of live on for quite a long time if there are very few of us. Do you want to know how long you could survive in a supermarket for as a single person? So I, I, I calculate that... the size of the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> and how much tin food there I mean, are. it does, and how hungry you are, I suppose. But, but as a ballpark figure, as a, as a thought experiment again, I, I calculated that for chapter one of the book. And I worked out that a single person locked into a supermarket uh, and had the key thrown away could survive for 55 years in a single wow. supermarket or 63 years if they're happy to eat all the canned dog food yeah. and cat food well, as I mean, well. That, there's there's a lot of preserved sustenance on the, on the shelves of the supermarket. Well, that, oh, there's a film in that. Point. I mean, if, 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 if it is a destroying people type of apocalypse, then that's going to give us an awful lot of time to think about what to do next while we're sitting in our, you know, one supermarket per sort of, per, per, per 10 miles and sort of walking along to meet each other in, in the middle. But as I say, I suppose, I suppose the, quest, the question is, really, how are you going to be sure that you get the right bits to start? I mean, it is your particular item, which is you know, you have to have the cans which are exactly the right size that fit together, which fit together with the big one, to make your fire. And it looks and it looks good, but I wouldn't know where to go and find them. So uh, the, the can again was just a, a brief demonstration, a, a brief kind of example of the sort of things you could do from scavenging and, and foraging in general. Um, but but I, there's something else you're hinting at there about different kinds of apocalypses, and not just whether it's an asteroid strike or a pandemic. But there's two kind of like yin and yang type apocalypses. There's an apocalypse where um, all the people die, but the stuff is left behind, and that might be something like a pandemic that targets humanity, and the, the cities are still there, they've not been destroyed by nuclear weapons, the cities are there, they're just depopulated. And the opposite of that would be some con kind of event or apocalypse that destroys our technological <coughs> infrastructure, but keeps humans alive, it doesn't touch people immediately. And Vinay hinted at what that might be as the Carrington event, which is a huge coronal mass ejection, a big burp of plasma that the sun spat towards the Earth in 1859, which is basically a pre-electrical society, and it sparked a couple of wildfires from the telegraph wires. If a CME were to hit the world today, it could knock out the electrical distribution grids, the power grids of, of a hemisphere of the world. Mm. And the frustrating thing about that is the thing that you need to repair those electrical grids and manufacture more transformers is electricity in your factories. So the idea is you get kind of knocked back down and it's very hard to pull itself back up. And maybe, although I don't think this is likely, if that were to happen, you now have a situation where the world has suddenly become de-technological, but there's still five, six billion people getting hungry and starting to look towards each other as to who's going to get the, the resources that are left behind. So I, I mentioned both ends of that spectrum in, in chapter one of the knowledge, and then I kind of explore on from what you could do in those sort of situations. There, is a, think... there is a funny little buffer that kicks in in that scenario, because you think immediately, oh my god, everybody's going to starve. But actually, I, I also ran the numbers for this, and there's four and a half months of cow for more or less the entire planet. We have enough cattle that if you just start eating the cattle, you've got about four and a half months of 1,200 calories a day for the entire human race already. There Which you go. Is a real surprise. And as long as we have enough ketchup to go around with the burgers. Then. Well, this gets into the, uh, the strategic condiment reserve. That, <laughs> that I can't discuss. So as a prep of Vinay, you don't have bottles of water and canned food. You've just got... Hines. Um, well, row upon row of Hines. Yeah, it, it, so the, 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 it, this is a, a long shaggy dog story, which I'll condense enormously. But it turns out that if you were to have a big pandemic in the States, your kind of smart move is to nationalise McDonald's and build a way of distributing the cows to people that doesn't pass the virus along the food supply chain. You can't have them going to the supermarket, they'll give each other the flu, so you have to basically have guys in trucks throwing the hamburgers into people's backyards, and the guy's wearing a moon suit, and it's all very complicated, but you can make it work. Like a futuristic paperboy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the thing that you run out of is ketchup, and if there's no ketchup, the kids won't eat the hamburgers for months at a time, and so the ketchup is just in time manufactured, so it turns out to get the whole plan to work, you need a national strategic condiment reserve. <laughs> And this is the kind of thing that happens when you, know, you start You know, I thought that policy. was a quip, but you've actually thought about that before. <laughs> yes. That. Oh, yes. No, no, no. I mean, it went into the strategic planning processes. This is your weak point. 
And this is the kind of thing that happens when you start taking the apocalypse seriously. Uh, we'll take a question from the top. I can't see anything but blinding light. So it's whoever's got the microphone can maybe pick a non-weird looking question for us. It's a definitional question. To what extent, we've been talking about apocalypse, but to what extent, what shock to a population, local or global, does there need to be 10%, 20% death rate in order to trigger the sort of breakdown in society that, that, that we're talking about? Because I suspect it's not 100%. It's, 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 it may only be 10 or 20% before things really start to fall apart. Hmm. Done. The, the numbers I've heard are around 20%. Yeah. Have you heard similar? Well, Ros, is this sort of thing that's come up in your research? Um, no, because, because I try and avoid thinking about the apocalypse. <laughs> but I do think that it's not necessarily just the percent, but the, the load, the current load on hospitals. Yeah. So if you've got a very slow epidemic, then your hospitals might be able to cope because it's not that many people sick at once. Yeah. But if it's very quick, then you can actually, uh, that's much, much more difficult to cope with for the hospitals. And also, if they're overloaded, people tend to do less well, so that will, you know, build up. Do you technically stuff. need people to be in a hospital for the care from a, a pandemic? I mean, obviously, it depends enormously on what the disease is. But a lot of the time, it's just trying to keep fluids in, in the human body so you don't basically die of dehydration if, if you're sick. Is it, so there's something you could do just, as Vinay was saying, chucking hamburgers from a <laughs> passing car. Could, could it be like just distributing IV kits to households? Yeah, uh, I'm not totally sure, but during the 2009 flu pandemic in the UK, when they were giving out antivirals, instead of, normally when people have flu, they'll go to their doctor and get given um, not that much. But during the 2009 flu pandemic, they were giving out antivirals and you were asked to send a representative to collect them. And this was to aim to try and decrease the contacts mm. between sick people. So you can do stuff like that medically. That's not my field. Yeah. I mean, you, the, there's a book called A Paradise Built in Hell, which kind of looks at uh, post-disaster stuff. And it turns out that, that kind of sustained Mad Max chaos just doesn't really happen. What you get is brief periods of uh, disorder followed by very quick social reorganization. So the idea that you kind of pull the pin on the thing and it immediately goes vump is true of things like the industrial supply chain, which is very fragile, but society as a whole, generally speaking, doesn't just collapse when something sneezes. You get a bit of chaos and then people pull it back together again. And you know, the delicate thing that we don't know is how much disruption to the industrial supply chain before you wind up with food shortages. Uh, and I'm actually, having, having actually looked at this in a fair amount of detail, uh, I think that the food shortage thing is kind of overblown because you do just wind up with this kind of season of burgers. Uh, and in that time period, three and a half, you know, four and a half months is enough time to reorganize damn near anything. So I actually went into that like, oh my God, we're three meals from anarchy and came out with like, it's more like four and a half months. I have a different perspective if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to put this out to the audience actually because um, if... We detected an asteroid that was, say, 10 kilometers in size that was going to hit and it was going to wipe out all life on the planet and it was going to hit in 30 years' time. So nobody's dead. Infrastructure still exists. Um, would that cause a collapse of a civilization? So, so that's... Nobody's dead, but you know it's going to happen. So I think that's something else to, to bear in mind, that we don't actually have to kill anybody. This is the deep impact yeah. scenario. Yeah. Yes, the exactly. Film, yeah. I bet we spent the first 18 years arguing about who's going to have to pay for the mission to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have any more questions? I feel like I've been neglecting this side a little bit. Have we got the microphone? Uh, could we come here, please? Yeah, the scenario. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I've just got two thoughts. <laughs> One, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Is Yellowstone Park uh, a particular risk? Are the large sort of volcanic uh, of magma meant to be a, a probable risk of going up? And I'm missing a, a TV program on it where the scenario of the actual event into the, the atmosphere and you know, taking away the sun, blocking the light, that is, it actually could well be a, uh, oh, yeah. an, an event. That it's a Yellowstone supervolcano, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, so a caldera. Um, yeah, yeah so, so, so Yellowstone is the one that they talk about quite, quite often. So the entire Yellowstone National Park is essentially is a, is a, is a volcano. And there are always different risks that you've mentioned, and including that one. Um, one thing that did actually get me a bit sort of anxious 
with the nuclear one, and um, Professor Krauss, there's a thing called the minute clock, and when um, Trump became president, it moved to three minutes to midnight. It, it moved, there's about three minutes left. Mm. So that seemed to have a greater consequence. And these are top physicists who have put it all together with a probability event mm. over all these other, other events that might happen. Yeah, I, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, if, if you don't mind, I think, I think that, that you raise actually a really, really uh, good point because um, humans aren't very good at dealing with, uh, with risk. Um, we're not good at assessing risk. We don't understand what risk actually is. So um, we take risk every single day. Uh, so just stepping out of the house, getting into a car, is, 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 that's a risk. Uh, in order to do it. And, you, and you make the decision, you, you're ignoring that risk. Yet we focus on risks that actually probably would never happen, you know, the, uh, events that would probably uh, not happen to us. And then worry about those and we invest money in those kind of things. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we, um, we probably need to overcome uh, in order to deal with some of the threats that we've heard about tonight. Um, we, we don't understand the risks, we don't deal with them well. So, so yeah, nobody's talked about the, the, the caldera, yeah, there was a, a program on it, but that's probably more likely to happen, say, than a major asteroid impact. But in the, um, that is an inevitability, it will erupt the next time, as yeah. to whether it's within the lifetime of human civilization anyway. Yeah, I mean, I or can... Or it's well, 100,000 years. Yeah. Well, while we're confined on Earth, right, it's a risk. But human civilization could very easily be spread halfway across the galaxy in a thousand years. You know, it's not... Uh, you know, there's a, there's, we're in this very vulnerable window where we've got all the eggs in a single basket. Mm -hmm. The one egg in the one basket. Yes, exactly. Right. And getting out of that stage where we're vulnerable because we're all cooped up on the same planet seems to be the generic solution, right? If you've got humans scattered across uh, certainly the solar system uh, and something catastrophic happens, there is a decent chance that you can survive as a species, rebuild, colonize, grow, keep it moving. But we're in this very vulnerable little window for maybe another 50 years where if something terrible happens, we're all stuck here. Uh, and that really kind of worries me. Like, you know, there's a certain irony that would be there if, like, ah, oh, so close. As, as soon as we become aware of that risk, it then wipes us out before we can do anything about it. Uh, my money's on Elon. He's going he's to save the world. Uh, we have time for one, perhaps two questions. Let's go to the back here. And not just this world. Yes. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, I noticed dur during your demonstration you made a fatal error of not wearing safety specs. <laughs> this is it. I, I think certain uh, standards will be pushed aside when you're being chased by zombies yeah. and things like safety specs are going to... But to be fair, you, you don't wear safety specs next to a bonfire, right? Mm. Well, it's just I almost set fire to my face. But, uh, my question is about the car, the, bio, the sort of biomass fueled vehicles. You know, what's the miles to the, to the kilogram of, of um, biomass do you get? How efficient would these vehicles be compared to the most efficient current petrol sort of driven? That vehicles? is a great question. Uh, the number is in the book. I just happen to not remember what it is. But you're right, you, you don't get miles per gallon for these cars. You get miles per pound or miles per kilo of wood. And the efficiency is down because the reason we drive petrol-powered cars, not wood-powered cars, is because petrol is way better. Wood. But if you don't have that as an option, you can drop down to slightly more primitive means like and use something like a small like steam engine, basically. It's equivalent. You'd have to have enough wood in the back. The back seat would be, I presume, full of wood. So if you... There's a, there's a bunch of pictures on the book's website of these cars, because I went all steampunk nerdy on them, and most of them have a, a small trailer behind them. You get like a... Because the Scandinavians love doing this. They have a, a Volvo car with a little mini trailer behind it, and this little pile of wood, and they just pull over the side of the road every now and then and kind of chuck some more wood in the front and then and poodle off. Um, it's adorable. It's brilliant. <laughs> was there another question? I think that was it. That's Excellent. About how efficient. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have time for one final question. Who is confident they have a question that we can, we can end on? Um, should we go to this young chap here? Um, in terms of asteroids, how long would you have to have that, that ship next to an asteroid in order to change its trajectory using gravity? And can, can we do that at the moment? Do we have enough time to send a ship out to change an asteroid? <laughs> Good question. Um, so the answer is actually you don't need to spend that long. Um, the, so, so in the grand scheme of things, what we need to do first is to detect an asteroid well in advance. So we, we're talking um, potentially decades here. Um, 
that gives us time to send out a, a, a spacecraft to, to arrive at that point, and then, and then we're talking probably months in, in order to deflect it, because, because over that period of time, that, that, say that 30-year window, 20-year window, you just need that small nudge in order to make it miss the Earth. You know, in the solar system terms, the Earth is a really tiny dot. Um, so, so, so we have the technology available to us now. Uh, we've demonstrated already technology to deflect an asteroid. That was a, a NASA ran a mission called Imp a Deep Impact. Um, and they impacted a, a, a comet. Uh, not to deflect it, but to understand what the composition of the comet was. But it's the, exactly the same technology. So as I mentioned before, we have the technology now to prevent an asteroid from hitting the Earth uh, only if we detect it far in, in advance. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I suppose, ironically, for an event about the apocalypse, we have now run out of time. I, I was thinking about that for the last two minutes, and you laughed. Um, I can't speak perfectly for my guests, but I assume that they will be more than happy to answer your questions if you want to come down and chat more informally at the front. I'll open a single final shameless plug for my book, The Knowledge, which by no coincidence at all, is available outside, and I can sign it for if you were to wish. Um, and the final thing is to thank all of you for coming along and all of our guests for also coming along and talking with and at you. Thank you.